All right, folks, welcome, welcome, welcome to the Smart Art Business Podcast. My name is Rachel Wilkins, delighted to be joined today by Max Neutra. Max is an artist and designer based in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Max, welcome to the show. It's great to have you here. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks for having me. So you, uh, we met a few years ago. We met in Santa Fe. I was doing a little project out there with um, with a sculptor who is also based in New Mexico, Gino Miles. Uh, you came and created some artwork on uh, some some three D pieces. Uh, you're somebody who has had a really rich and diverse career over the years. But one of the things that I loved on your website was you have this, this laundry list of places that you've painted. You're somebody who likes to get out and, pee, and paint in the wild, shall we say. Tell us why that is. Uh, that's a great question. Um, I, painting out in public was something I kind of stumbled into by accident. It was actually, it actually started with a friend who was in a band in LA who said, you should come paint on stage with us. And, and I kind of went, I don't know, is that really, I don't, you know, and I tried it out and it was so fun. And, um, and that was kind of how I got into it. And I realized really quickly that painting out in public is not, it's, it's almost more about the public than it is about the painting. You really get to do stuff and then immediately get reactions to it. You, you know, it's almost like a social experiment. What happens if I do this? And then you see what happens. Um, and so it really, that, that just getting in the mix in that way really became something that uh, was, you know, not only fun, but kind of educational. It helped me kind of grow an understanding of how to trigger certain emotions in people and how to, you know, get, um, get people to feel things, you know, because I could just see it happen right in front of me. It's so interesting because I think as, as artists, when we create, we, we generally create from, I, I think I speak for most of us from a pretty vulnerable place, you know, and when we come to actually present that work and put it out into the public eye, it can be very intimidating. I can't imagine, you know, that, well, I imagine there is an extra layer of vulnerability that comes with creating it in real time and then having those eyes directly on on your work, what what has been, I guess, some of the the challenges and versus some of the the things that you can celebrate in those moments? Yeah, vul vulnerability. That's a good word for it. Um, you know, in a way, you, when I was painting live all the time, like there was a time when I was doing it as much as I possibly could out in Los Angeles, and LA is a great place for that because the weather's great year round. There's just so many activities that you know my buddies and I would would just be like, where are you painting this week? And, you know, there was always somewhere to paint. And so painting live was um, not, it was almost like having a mobile studio and and having an audience, having, you know, the pressure of, of kind of performing or just trying to deliver anything at all. Um, someone watching meant that I needed to be working. And so in a way it was like a motive that it, you know, I used to joke with my friends. I used to say, hey, do you think you could paint without anyone watching? <laughs> and, 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 you know, once I kind of started painting even more and more for galleries and that sort of thing, and I was in the studio, I noticed that I missed the, the energy. And, um, you know, so, so yes, there was a little bit of nervousness, a little bit of uh, vulnerability, but that also provided a kick in the pants to get it done. Um, and so, yeah, I, there was definitely that to overcome, but also, it, it was the struggle and also the reward at the same time. That's incredible. So now, I mean, we're going to talk on a much deeper level about some of the things that you've been involved in in the last 12 months. You are now an experienced designer for Meow Wolf. Uh, for anybody who doesn't know what Meow Wolf is, they probably have been under a rock in the art world because it has been huge news over the last 12 years. Uh, it's Meow Wolf is an American arts and entertainment company founded in 2008 that creates large scale immersive art installations and produces art, music, festivals, music videos and streaming uh, streaming entertainment. Um, this is the one that I'm most excited about though. Mio's, Mia Wolf's second permanent installation, Omega Art, is an interactive mind-bending art experience where participants explore an extraordinary supermarket that bursts into surreal worlds and unexpected landscapes. Now, tell us a little bit about, well, first of all, how did you get involved with Mia Wolf? Then I wanna go back a little further if we can. Um, sure, yeah, Meow Wolf 
Yamel yeah, started in Santa Fe as an art collective, and I think they officially formed in around 2008. I was in LA at the time, but I grew up out in Santa Fe. I was born out in LA. I grew up in Santa Fe. I went back out to LA for a while, like after high school and worked around there and did a bunch of art stuff out there and ended up coming back to Santa Fe again. And by the time I got back to Santa Fe, they, they were right in the middle of building the um, exhibit that's here that really kind of got them well known. It's called the House of Eternal Return. They were in the middle of building this house and there's a lot of buzz around it. And I was tried to kind of go, I, I, you know, I reached out to people and I said, hey, I'm Max, I grew up here. I'm an artist, uh, it's so cool what you guys are doing. Let me come hang out. And they said, yeah, just come, come over to the house. We'll, you know, we'll figure out something for you to do. And, and then that like five seconds later, I had my, my kid, my, my, um, my daughter, Zoe, and I immediately realized, oh, I'm, you know, I got to spend some, <laughs> there's not a lot of like time to volunteer, you know, and I got to be a dad. I'm like hanging out with my, my baby. And that lasted um, two years of just being a freelance artist and having a really flexible schedule to help raise my daughter. It was really beautiful and amazing. Um, but once that, once she turned two, is when the, the fog lifted kind of, you start going, yeah, she's gonna make it, you know? And I'm <laughs> like, maybe I should start looking for some, like a real gig around here, you know? And, and so I reached out again and, and uh, reached out to Vince, who is the CEO. And I just basically said, same thing, same story. I'm Max, I'm an artist. And, I, and the, the, it took me a year of, of kind of hounding Vince. And, and I tried to do that balance of being just squeaky enough, but not too squeaky, you know, to have him sort me. And he find, and I was basically like, look, I'm already one of you. I'm just not on the, the payroll yet. You know, I'm already one. Of you. And, and he, and he did eventually he sorted me. And, um, you know, we did, I did some contract work for him to prove that I could do what I said I could do. And so I did a bunch of concept art and I built something that's, that's, uh, it's called the voice activated kaleidoscope that's in the house of eternal return now. And so I, pro I had to prove myself, but once I did, he said, okay, I'm going to put you as the narrative fabricator. That was my title when I started and in the narrative, in the newly formed narrative department. So it was me and about eight writers. And, and it was like an experiment. He said, just let's see what happens if, if we stick, stick an artist here with these writers. Maybe you do some concept work, maybe you build some objects. I don't know, let's see what happens, you know? And, and so that experiment lasted through the, uh, through the most of building um, the uh, exhibit out in Las Vegas. It's um, Omega Mart, Omega Mart in Vegas. And, and basically what I did was I helped influence the story. I'm a decent writer, but I let most of the writing to the writers. Um, but I would say, yeah, what about this? What about that? I did a lot of drawings. And then once the story started coming into focus, I started suggesting actual objects to make to help tell that story, you know? So and so it's, you know, kind of like a production designer gig was uh, another way to call it. Um, but, but it was super fun. And, and I had a lot of autonomy. It was a lot of just me going, what, hey, what if we build this? And someone would go, yeah, go for it. And, and then, you know, we'd add it to the list of things that I made for, for Vegas. It sounds like you had a lot of creative freedom. It sounds like that's, that's kind of an artist's dream, right? To be able to just express in, that, in those manners and yeah. with a budget to support it. Absolutely. It, it didn't come without its, um, you know, there was some struggles. There was just some little things like, you know, how do we, you know, within the company, I was the only guy that had this title narrative fabricator. And that was just something we made up. It's like, that's not a common, that's not a thing that's like an industry standard. I was meeting people, new people that were coming into the company and they'd reach out to me. They'd be like, I just want to know what is it that you do? You know, I don't understand what narrative fabricator even is, you know? And so there was a lot of freedom and flexibility, which works well for me and my personality. I can kind of run with it. Um, but there was also a little bit of, you know, kind of helping people understand within the company, what it, what is Max doing? What's this guy doing? And the good news is that I, I can deliver, you know, I can say that I'm going to do something and then I do it. And so once I did that enough, people started going, oh, okay, Max is okay. He's, he'll be fine. Yeah. I think it's really wonderful that a lot of uh, obviously Mia Wolf it was an arts collective kind of from from the get go. So you know, yes, they were going to look for creative people to build that vision. 
But I think we're seeing a lot of companies, a lot of startups, a lot of Silicon Valley companies that are looking more for creative minds. They're looking less to the academia. They're looking for these creative thinkers. And one of the things I really, I'm trying to do with the podcast and with this show is to bring in folks who are having measure, measurable success where they're using their creativity and it's not the conventional path that you would necessarily think of when you when you think of how society has de- defined art world success. So one of the things that I loved that, that you mentioned very early in the story is your persistence, because I think a, there's a lot of misconceptions around, you know, I should wait for the idea to come from come to me or I should just apply and wait to be picked. I love that you were so like just resist so so persistent in your in badgering the person, you know, asking more than once. Tell us tell us how that's worked for you over the years. Is it something you've always done? Was it always it just with this particular project? I think it's something I've always done. I've always had a little bit of a rebellious streak. I was just talking to a friend recently. I was, I said, you know, by now it's a coworker. I said, you know, by now my rebellious thing. And she was going, yeah, oh yeah, I know. And I, I said, but I'm not like, I, I'm not a mean rebel. I don't, I want to be nice about it. It's like, I want to, I want to kind of challenge people's ideas and I kind of want to break the rules, but I'm also not like step, trying not to hurt people's feelings and step on people's toes. You know, an example of that was out in LA when I was pinning live, there was a couple shows that I just showed up to uninvited. I just showed up with my stuff and was like, where am I painting? And they went, oh, right over here. And, you know, there's a time I, I set up out on the sidewalk outside of Staples Center. I figured out when, when the, the, the Lakers game was going to get out. And I set up outside of Staples Center um, right when this crowd of, you know, was 60,000 people like walked by. Um, and, you know, so I would do these kind of guerrilla stunts. There was fancy art shows. Um, it was called the LA Art Show or something down at the, the hangar in Santa Monica. I forget, it's been a few years now. And that was like a, you know, kind of a blue chip situation. I just went and parked across, like set up on the corner right across the street from the entrance and painted there. So yeah, I, I there was there's a little bit of a kind of a rebel kind of punky thing that I that's in my blood. Um, but at the same time, I'm aware, I'm keenly aware of, you know, just humans and how he, he, they remember, one of my favorite quotes is uh, from Maya Angela. she says, you know, people remember you, they don't remember what you did, they remember how you made them feel, mm-hmm. right? So even though I'm kind of like breaking the rules and stuff like that, I'm also trying to, you know, smile and be nice about it. <laughs> and, and so that's a little bit of a balance. And that's kind of what I was doing with, with Vince too. I was, you know, smiling and just saying like, I'm here, I'm ready when you Me are. Again. You know? yeah. <laughs> no, I agree with that. And, and I think I can certainly pinpoint moments in my career and opportunities that I've had down to those moments where I was incredibly persistent and didn't take no for an answer. It usually came on like the third ask. Like if I, if, if I didn't get it on the third, then I go away, right? Like that was the squeaky right. wheel gets the oil, but yes, don't be a pain in the ass, right? right? <laughs> but one of the things that I see consistently with those that do have success, and you know, it's a quality that you have as well, is that humility, right? That willingness to be a good human being. Like you can be persistent, but you can't be persistent and be an asshole. Right? Yeah. You're not going to get the opportunities. You can't be persistent and have a giant ego. You've right. got to be willing to collaborate. You've got to be. You've got to be teachable as well. Absolutely. So I, I think those are just you know two of the biggest qualities that I've seen in in artists when it comes to you know having that level of success is humility, grit, and persistence for sure. Yeah. I, yeah. That's great. So. Let's talk a little bit about collaboration because this Mia Wolf project has over 200 collaborators. You're working with a lot of people and as creatives, you know, often we do spend time alone with our ideas. What are some of the rewards and challenges of working with, with a team that large? Um, this is something I, I, that's a great question. This is something I said to, you know, we have these Slack channels at Meow Wolf that are, you know, there's some that are just kind of different labels, random, or there's one for all of our dog, we post pictures of our dogs. There's um, ones about what to listen to today and stuff like that. And then some, you know, some of our are company-wide. And there was one that I, um, one on the company-wide Slack channel about a year and a half in to working at Meow Wolf, it's been three years now. Um, I posted a, a message that was, about this realization that I had, 
you know, when I first started wanting to work at Meow Wolf, um, I wanted to work there because I wanted to make cool stuff. Oh, if I work at Meow Wolf, I'll get to make really cool stuff. It was actually an answer to um, one of my kind of uh, manifestation questions in my head. It was like, what are, where do I want my art to take me? What do I want to do now? And the answer was, I want to have the resources to make bigger things than I can do now. I want to have, and whatever those, in whatever form those resources, you know, come. And, and then I saw, well, if I work for Meow Wolf, I'll have the resources to make bigger stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so I went and got the gig and I worked at Meow Wolf and I made some stuff including some of the biggest, coolest stuff I've made. And, and that stuff came and went. The stuff was, you know, we worked hard and we made it and then it got shipped up and it left. And then, and then I'm like, Stan, I'm still here. And, and I'm looking around and I realized, oh man, you know, the real cool thing about working at Meow Wolf is not necessarily the stuff that we get to make. Yes, it's fun. Don't get me wrong. Oh, so fun to be able to, to have access to, all of the, you know, these fabricators and these tech, these people that can like program lasers and sound guys and computer people and material experts that you can kind of work with to make things that you'd never be able to make on your own. That is absolutely fun. But the stuff comes and goes. And when the dust settles, you're just standing there with all the other people. And that's what I realized the real, the real day to day value of working at a place like Meowth is being amongst all of these people. Mm -hmm. That's the stuff that you, that's the thing that sticks. And, and it's, and all these, it's brilliant, passionate people that have their own amazing stories of, you know, adventures before they got there. And so just getting to know these people and having them be your kind of collaborators, um, your, 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 your creative family, um, that is amazing. And I've talked to people that have left Meow Wolf, you know, um, that I used to work with and they would say, I miss, that's what they would say they miss they don't miss the big projects they miss the people yeah mm. was there a particular piece that was that kind of stands out as a highlight to you a particular project within the whole scope of Mia Wolf that you were really excited about um yeah there's there's uh there's two of them that are kind of on opposite ends of the spectrum one was this thing called um the source periodic table. And so in, in, in uh, Vegas there at Omega Mart, um, it's, uh, wow, well, I'm not gonna get into the whole story, but basically it's a kind of a weird supermarket and they've got weird ingredients that they're pulling from a source well in the back. And, 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 and my buddies and I were kind of talking about like, well, what, what elements of source are they putting into these products? And how do they kind of distill this element from this element? And, and maybe we should define that. And, and what is source made of? And so we kind of broke down source uh, into its uh, into its elements, and it was you know hours of sitting in a room with a buddy, kind of like really getting nitpicky about which word to describe each element. And it was like poet, it was like a cross between poetry and writing a heavy metal song, and and it was just super fun. And then the reason that was great though was because it was this real base level kind of narrative thing that we could then use to kind of flesh out the world, you know, we would then, we were then writing like, um, you know, uh, um, equations that were using, you know, elements from the source thing. And we were, you know, there's all this, all these ways that that kind of, kind of uh, filtered through the rest of the exhibit. There's like Petri dishes with little notes about which elements are in there. And, and so that was a really fun one on kind of on like, and it was all it ended up being was a poster, a beautiful poster. But the, it's the it's what's on the poster that was amazing. And then on the opposite end of that was this thing that was called the Osmosatron, which um, was a situation where my buddy Colin uh, uh, was working up a list of things that might go in this one room in the exhibit. It was the Dart Room, which is basically kind of research and development in the background. And, um, and so I, I literally looked over his shoulder and was like, what, what are you working on? And he's like, oh, I don't know, I'm just kind of coming up with ideas for the dart room. And, um, and I said, oh, I might have an idea. And I did a quick sketch of like a weird machine that's like infusing, you know, the idea is like they're getting cereal and then they're like infusing it with source and, and that we can use this machine to tell the story that they're putting source into these products. And, um, 
Corvus, the the creative director for um, the for the Omega Mart, saw this drawing, you know, as part of the list of proposed objects, and he goes, "Yeah, you got, yeah, make that." And so all of a sudden, there's this machine that's like involved, you know, I don't know, 25 people. Um, we had um, 3D designers design. You know, I did more more elaborate sketches, and then we had 3D designers. We had fabricators welding stuff. We had um, you know, people kind of building just specific elements for it. And, and, and I got to just kind of be the guy at the center that was, you know, kind of being like the art director for it and, and helping make decisions about specific things. Um, there's a, a person named Wolves that programmed it. And, and so we got to, you know, figure out what the lights do and the sounds do when you put your hand on this thing. And, and it was really just such a special moment for me. I'd never been able to have access to a team of brilliant people to kind of realize that something like that yeah so that's just like an artist dream right to see your idea kind of come to fruition like that absolutely are you somebody that you know we talk about these like crazy ideas that you know bubble away at the surface like are you somebody that can turn that off because i know for a lot of us i certainly i'll speak personally like if i get an idea it can keep me up till four or five o'clock in the morning. I have a notepad at my bed, you know, that I, that I scribble things down. <laughs> Are you, you're also a father, like, you know, balancing that kind of, that, that role with this artist creative mind. Do you find that you're able to kind of switch that up? That's a good question. I, I, I've done this long enough now, both for myself and for Meow Wolf, um, on, on, on a scale that is just, you know, I've just done it so much that I, I can recognize within myself, my own kind of internal chemical landscape, you know, and, and so I can tell if I'm having a moment where it's coming fast and furious. And, and I can even talk to Laura, my wife, like, oh, I'm having a moment, I gotta like, you know, just leave me alone so I can capture this. Mm -hmm. And I try to take advantage of the moments that it's coming easily. And then there's, and, and I know, and I know that those moments come and then there's these lulls too. There's these moments where I'm just like, I'm sitting just staring at the page, like nothing's happening. And, and so, <clears throat> you know, the good news is that I'm aware of that. And I, you know, I'm, like, for example, during the lulls, I'm not freaking out. I'm not going, I've lost it. You know, I, I just know that it ebbs and flows. And I try to just, I've had a kind of a Zen approach to life in general about that stuff life comes and goes and you know good things and bad things and try not to swim against the current too hard and, you know try to catch the waves that carry you and that kind of thing and and so that's how I approach my creative uh ebbs and flows as well is I I understand you know when it's happening and I also understand when it's not and I just do other things when it's not I you know what do you um, when, when it comes to being a dad, I think it's great. I think being a, an artist dad is a good, really good fit for me. And I get to, you know, um, do a lot of art projects with Zoe. But really the thing I'm, I, I like to have rub off on Zoe, it's not necessarily how to draw or how to paint or how to make stuff. It's how to think about stuff, how to come up with creative solutions to problems and understanding that there's, you know, other angles of approach. And so I ask her questions, what would you do about this? And, you know, and it's been really fun seeing her grow in that way. Where do you pull your ideas from? What, what influences you? Is there, you know, do you have this, this creative well that you go to? Do you listen to certain music? Do you read certain books? What is, what inspires your, your thinking, your creative thinking? Um, I, <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a fun one. It evolves in terms of like materials. Yeah, I mean, you know, I watch shows and I play occasional video games. You know, this is all kind of like late night when I'm when I'm not when I'm too tired to do anything else. Basically, I do like to read books. David Eagleman is this amazing um, guy who does uh, you know studies neuroscience, and so I learn about why people do what they do um, and uh, the neuroscience behind uh, all of that, and that's really interesting to me. Um, I am an electronic musician. So there's, that's a really good trick for me is during a time that I'm feeling kind of stuck or something, I've got my little kind of modular synthesizer set up where I just, I can just turn it on in like 10 seconds, I'm making sounds and I'll just jam for 10 minutes, you know, just kind of tweaking sounds and then go back to drawing. Um, so it's nice to kind of have something to turn to. 
and and just kind of not think about it. Um, when it comes to like solving problems, like creative problems for Meow Wolf, I've figured out this um, method of kind of, you know, finding the boundaries of what's possible. So I'll go, I'll go too sick. We say too sick. It's like, I, I'll go too sick, you know, knowing good and well that it's too sick. I'll, I'll, do, I'll, propose, I'll do a drawing for something that's never going to happen. I know it's never going to happen. We don't have the budget. We don't have the time. But what's fun about going there is to see what might come out of that. There might be some elements there that you could pull into the, re into the realistic version. So I'll do the too sick version just to get almost to get it out of your system, find what's there. And then I'll go to the other end of the spectrum, the what's the simplest way we can do this? Mm -hmm. What's the way we can do this with, you know, Elmer's glue and pops, popsicle sticks. What's the way I can do this with just dots and lines, you know, and, and find the simplest way as well. And then once you kind of find those boundaries, then you kind of meet in the middle. That's awesome. So you do come from a very creative family. Uh, you are the grandson of Richard Neutra, uh, one of the, you know, most prolific and influential architects of the 20th century. Tell us about your relationship with your grandfather. Um, uh, yes, I'm I actually am the great grandson sorry, of, great for Richard. Yeah, that's how removed I am. But that 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 that's been an interesting thing. Um, he died in 1970. I was born in 78, so I never met him. Mm -hmm. But he's been this kind of looming figure for me, you know, for obvious reasons. He's family, and and um, my grandfather Dion, his son, was also an architect, mm -hmm. and um, and I did know Dion. Um, you know, the biggest thing that being related to Richard has done for me is it provided an example of like what's possible. Mm. You know what I mean? It's, it was this thing where I kind of went, oh, like here's this guy I'm related to and he did these great things. And so then you, can, then you kind of can turn in on yourself and go, well, are you going to do great things? Like, are you, what can you do? This guy did it. Maybe you can do some cool stuff, you know, and just I mean, I'm really grateful for that. It makes me think about folks that, um, you know, are coming up in hard situations that don't have a lot of examples of what's possible. Mm -hmm. You know, just seeing an example of what's possible can really change you, you know? It makes me want to be a mentor or something just to say like, hey, you know, there, there's something here that maybe you didn't see before. And, and, and Richard really did that for me. He, he showed me what might, what's possible. Um, later on, when I got older and and um, and I actually started being able to read his really wordy philosophical books that he was writing and understand them, I realized that um, there was certain I, I started seeing some of the stuff that kind of trickled down to me. There's a certain ways of thinking about things. For example, um, I would go on these hikes when I was younger. I would go on these hikes with my wife. And I'd kind of be talking to her on the way going like, why does a hike make me feel this way? There's, there's something about the unevenness of the terrain, you know, that makes my brain have to kind of shift into a different mode. You know, I was kind of doing stuff like that. And then later I was reading Richard saying, yeah, when I was a baby, I was, I remember hanging out under my mom's piano while she would play. And there's this edge where the wood floor would meet the carpet. And I would notice that edge. And well, how did that affect me as a baby? You know, he's kind of asking the same wow. questions. How does the environment change my brain, basically? And, and so that was kind of a fun discovery. I really do wish I could have hung out with him and just, you know, have some of these kind of endless Neutra philosophical conversations that we like to have with him. That would have been great. In terms of his legacy, have you been able to actually visit or spend any time at any of the properties that he, that he created? Yes, um, it. My grandfather Dion um, lived in a Neutra house, and um, and so I, you know, as a kid, I got to go to Richard's house. It's called the uh, the VDL house. It's on on the edge of Silver Lake um, in LA, and so I got to go there as a kid. And 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 I remember um, the even though Richard wasn't there, it, you know, it was still accessible to us. And. And I remember the stairs, the way the stairs kind of floated, they kind of hung on these metal rods. And, and I remember just that kind of blowing my mind as a kid, just going, oh, stairs can do this too. And, 
And then being in Dion's house a lot um, while I was in LA, we'd go there for the holidays and stuff. And there's is something magic about those those houses that that they designed. It's kind of yeah, you can look at pictures and you can see the cool kind of modern lines and stuff, but it's really hard to describe without, you know, you kind of got to be in it to really feel it. And you do, it's, it's a feeling that happens when you get in there. And, and, there and, and that's really what, you know, helps me understand the magic of those houses, that feeling that he's able to give you when you're sitting there just looking out the window, yeah. Who are some of your, your personal heroes aside from your, you know, the, your, your lineage, shall we say, is there anybody that's really influenced your career, artist or otherwise? Um, I have, um, you know, really, I have like influential artists that, um, oh no, this is, okay, now I just thought of someone more recent. I was thinking back, like when you're younger and more impressionable, like you're a teenager and you're starting to kind of like become who you are, there was artists like R. Crumb, um, and, but also uh, Ralph Steadman. I really love Ralph Steadman's kind of gonzo just the extreme levels that he can reach. Um, I also liked, um, oh, what's his name? Gerald Scarf, I think is his name. The guy that did the animations for uh, the Pink Floyd, the wall movie. And then, yeah, he's got a really cool style that I really liked. I got into Egon Scheel um, as, a, as I got a little older, Egon's work is cool. Um, but, you know, more modern, you know, what ends up happening is you end up kind of, um, meeting other artists and instead of you know these kind of mythological artists that exist outside of your your personal circle you start getting in more influenced by just the people that you're around and um, one guy that really I think was a big influence on me is this guy uh, named Sean Bono who hey Sean if you're listening um, Sean and I just had a conversation recently. Um, Sean uh, started um, this thing called Art Battles out in New York. He was going to school out in New York and he was like, uh, you know, we're all secretly competing in this art school anyway. So why don't we just put it out in the open and make it an actual competition? And so he started this thing called Art Battles. Eventually it grew and grew and he got these contracts to do Art Battles shows where we're basically painting on stage um, in, you know, in Europe, in Paris and, and um, Barcelona. And, and so I got to do art battles with Sean um, twice on two different tours. And, you know, obviously the painting itself was, you know, fun in a way that though, that was just the job. Like that was, you know, that wasn't the most influential part of those trips. The real influence was meeting those other artists in Paris and in Madrid and Barcelona, seeing their studios, meeting their friends, kind of getting to be plugged into the local art scene of those spaces. Um, that was really magical. And then also just Sean's way of being. Sean had this way of um, like we'd go out and he'd we'd be ordering something at the restaurant and I started noticing this and every time once I noticed it I, it was it cracked me up every time he'd do it he'd look at the menu and then he would inevitably he would not order anything <laughs> off the menu he'd just ask the waiter like what do you think I should get he was this guy that really wanted to just let life happen to him mm -hmm. and and so he had this magical magnetism for adventure because of that and so towards the end of the night, maybe we'd be splitting up and people would be going home. And if, uh, and if I, Sean was ever gonna stay out, I'd stick with Sean just cause I knew that if I just stuck with him that something crazy was gonna happen. And then inevitably it would, but, we, but it was also like, okay, he had a weird angel on his shoulder that was looking after him. And so we'd go on these adventures, but find our way home. And, and that kind of way of living of, you know, I was talking earlier about my Zen kind of quality of just trying to let things happen a little bit. I think I learned some of that from Sean. I think it's interesting that you, you mentioned about kind of that interconnectivity of, of artists, you know, globally. And I feel that we've been pitted against each other for so long. Yes, there's an element of fun, you know, with something like an art battle, but for so long, we've been kind of informed that we need to be, we're in competition with each other. There's only so many collectors. There's only so many opportunities. And I think with, with the online space, with the, the 
democratization of the art world with things like NFTs, all these changes that are happening really, really quickly over the last uh, you know, five years, especially in the last 12 months, we're, we're starting to see that a lot of that was, was a, a myth. There was a lot of smoke and mirrors, I think, put in place by the art world gatekeepers to keep us in our little boxes. You know, we're more powerful when we collaborate. We're more, um, you know, we're able to inspire more people when we collaborate, when we come together, when we have that interconnectivity. Have you seen that work for you in any, any other areas of your, of your career? Absolutely. I mean, one of my uh, bits of advice that I like to give um, young artists, if anyone's listening or asking, um, is that is to instead of competing with people to help other artists as much as you're able to, the more you can help other artists, the more that's going to come back to you. If you're if you're standing at a wall that you can't get over by yourself and there's other people kind of trying to get over the same wall, if you're able to give someone a boost up over that wall, eventually one of those people is gonna turn around and reach down and pull you up with them, you know? And so that's, yeah, I think that, mm, you know, not being too competitive. There's always, I think com competition is, can be fun, you know, and can be playful, but, but ultimately, I think you're gonna get much more traction out of teaming up and being helpful to other people. People will remember you for that and they'll turn to you again, you know, they'll come back to you. Oh, Max, you know, is, is reliable. Let's go get Max, you know? And so, yeah, I, I, I think that that is the way to go. I, I was watching this show about Formula One. It's called like Race to Win on um, Netflix. My friend got me into it. I wasn't a race car guy at all, but the drama, oh, it's so addictive. And the most recent episode, there's this guy, Toto Wolf is his name. I love his name. He's the, the, the lead of the Mercedes um, team. And he's talking about how, yeah, we don't, like other guys, they, they, they're looking left and right. And we just, we don't look left and right on the, on the track. You know, we just kind of, you know, we make sure that what we're doing is we kind of pay attention to what we're doing. We don't worry about what other people are doing, meaning like I'm not going to like try to trip up other people. I'm just going to do the best that I can, you know. And and so I feel like that's kind of related, like, yeah, do your best. Don't try to trip up other people, you know, um, if you can bring them along, you know. Yep. Ships rise together for sure. Yep. How important is relationship, have relationships been and, and networking been for you in your career? It's, it's, it's almost everything. I mean, you know, I went to, when I, when I got out of high school, I went to um, this, uh, this school in the Bay Area called Expression Center for New Media. And I took the sound arts program. I was wanting to be a music producer. And, you know, it was like a 14 month program. It costs like 35 grand or something. And and they're the two most important things that I learned at that school. You know, we learned how to record and all this stuff, um, but, you know, live sound, movie sound. The two most important things I learned were how to properly wrap cables. That was the most, that's the thing I like used the most in my whole life. And then the other thing was um, the, that to properly, to pay, to keep in touch with your coworkers. That was like the last day. The first, it was the first day and the last day. First day, here's how you properly wrap cables. Last day, this teacher of mine, Dave Bell was his name. He's like, make sure you get everyone's phone numbers because these are your people, you know? And it's, it was so true. I did now, 20 years later, I, my four, my three best friends are, are the guys that I was in class with at Expressions. And we kind of passed each other gigs over the years when we were all doing audio video stuff. And you know, it's, it's, it is a lot about who you know. And I feel like when I, when I say that out loud and I hear that it's about who you know, I think people can get nervous about that. Like, oh, I'm not very good at networking. I'm not very good at socializing and, and all of that. And, and I hear that. I remember being um, real nervous about that stuff too. Um, you know, especially starting out and going to shows in LA, you know, without, I'd just go to an opening without knowing if I was going to know anybody there. And, and really the hurdle for me and, this, and the, the advice I can give is, is just go, just go without knowing. You don't have to know if anyone's gonna be there or not. Just get over that hump of like, get out of the house. Oh, it's these days with COVID, it's like, get out of the house, but- Go to a Zoom. You know, 
Yeah, right. Try like do it. Go go to the event. Just go and see what happens. And almost every time I would, I'd get over my my thing. Like I don't want to go out there. I'm not going to drive all the way across LA to go to this thing, and I don't even know what it's going to be like. Almost every time I would get over that and get myself in the car and just go. I, I was grateful. There was almost every time there'd be something that would happen that would, that made it worth it. I can, I can relate to that. You know, I am, uh, there's a big part of me that is an introvert and I would often go to these events and just feel like, you know, you want the ground to kind of swallow you up, but I would you know, commit to myself that I would introduce myself to five people. Like that was the rule. I had to, I couldn't leave until I at least had a conversation with five people that I didn't know. And it's amazing the results that can happen when you do that. Absolutely. So I think I'd be remiss, Max, if I didn't ask you about the rabbits. Tell, <laughs> us, about, tell us about the rabbits, because when I met you, you were painting a lot of rabbits. Yeah. Where, where was that kind of idea conceived, conceived from? And how did you manage to stay committed to the, that same idea for, for such a long period of time? That's a great question. The, the rabbits were, an, uh, again, kind of an accident. I was painting live on stage at a rave. And, and so we're talking late night, not the usual 2 a.m. shutdown. It was more like a 4 a.m. shutdown. And, but around uh, 2 in the morning, I, I was pretty tired at that point. And I'm looking around. It's like peak you know, craziness in the, in the crowd. And I'm looking around kind of tired and I think, man, look at us, you know, humans, we love to party. You know, we're gonna, it doesn't matter if the world is ending, we're gonna dance our way just off the edge of the cliff. We're just gonna party into oblivion, you know? And, and I was like, why is that? Why are, why do we, what is that about? And I'm like, well, you know, we're kind of like rabbits in that we proliferate, you know, it's built into us that we're, you know, we're like these rabbits. And so I did this one real rough kind of canvas of, a sea of rabbits, real, you know, kind of, I've never done one before. So it's kind of, you know, figuring it out. And um, at the end of the night, when the lights came up, uh, a woman uh, stopped by and was checking out my work. Her name was Liberty. And she, she it was just this chance, I me mean, talk about just go out, go out and meet people. It was just this chance moment where she was looking through my print rack and she kind of goes, I'll take one of these, one of these, one of these, one of these, one of, you know, and I'm stacking up and I'm kind of going, what's going on here? And then she points to the bunny painting and she goes, how much for that? Um, and I say, I don't $600. And she goes, okay, I'll take it. And can you paint me two more <laughs> for my friends? Liberty ended up being this incredible figure in my life. Um, but, you know, so I, I painted two more right away, obviously. And, and by the end of that third bunny painting, I started realizing oh, you know, there's something here about the way the shapes of the rabbits kind of fit together. You know, if you're covering a canvas with rabbits, you want it to look, or for me, I wanted it to look like they're random and natural, but at the same time, you know, the way the lines intersect and, 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 and all of that, like needed to feel right. It needed to feel random, but also feel good. And, and so there's this weird kind of puzzle solving aspect to it. And, and I started kind of, the rabbits turned into this almost like a building block or something like they they represent us like the rabbit is me or the rabbit is you um but all, and and i could get a lot squeeze a lot of personality and a lot of emotion about out of a single rabbit in, in its position whether it's standoffish and leaning back or curious and sniffing something i, I started kind of seeing all these different emotions i can kind of evoke and and something is in this simple shape and so it, it turned into this kind of exploration of just that shape. What kind of stories can I tell with this like pillow with ears shape, you know? And, and, um, and I ended up painting, I don't know, hundreds. I cut hundreds of them out of wood with a jigsaw. I actually messed my shoulder up. My shoulder got a little messed up from all of the jigsaw work. I had to like, you know, do some rehab on my shoulder. That's how much I did it, yeah. You suffered for your art. Yeah. So, you know, you, you come off of this huge project with Mia Wolf. What is next? What's, what's, what's kind of your big aspiration? You have any, anything that you're manifesting currently for your next, your next big project? Yeah. You know, I, well, the, the thing that's really kind of at the forefront of my mind right now is the next Mia Wolf exhibit, which is opening in Denver later this year. 
I can't, I, I can't get into the details about what's going to be in there. But the thing I've been saying to my friends is, hey, Meow Santa Fe is beautiful. It's the original Meow Wolf. It's a special, magical place. You can get lost in there. It's gorgeous. It feels like it's been made by humans. It's this amazing, special place. Meow Wolf Vegas is bigger. It's, you know, more than twice the square footage, if I'm, I'm I think I got that right. And so we, it, what I was worried about Vegas was that it might start being too polished, you know, like soon we got a bunch of money. And so now does, is the, is that kind of gritty DIY artist thing going to get lost? And when, and I was pleased to, you know, discover at once Vegas was kind of done, I'm looking around going, yeah, this feels like a bunch of uh, ragtag artists just got a bigger budget, <laughs> but it's still a bunch of ragtag artists, you know? And, and so it has that feeling of like, what are these, what do these artists do with the bigger budget? And it, it's amazing and beautiful. But Denver is like, to me, that's the one I'm most excited about. There's stuff in there that is really just game changer stuff. There's elements of that exhibit that are worth the price of admission alone. Like people would pay just to do this one thing and there's 30 different things, you know? And so I'm really excited about Denver and getting that buttoned up. And we're, you know, in the sprint to the finish on that. In terms of personal work, I've been um, fantasizing about books. I want to make children's books. I have this kid, you know, so I'm I'm kind of tuned into the 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 the, the child brain, you know, right now, and and I really want to make a couple uh, kids books. I've got ideas for that, um, but you know, as an example of how much time I have, I only painted three personal paintings. Um, all throughout all of last year, you know, because I'm so fully dedicated to Meow Wolf. And thank God I love my job. I truly love my job there. Um, and so I'm okay with how dedicated I am to Meow Wolf. Um, but you know, that's that's what's on the that's what's on the percolator is those books. Let's see if we can squeak some of those out. So Max, any final thoughts? Pearls of wisdom that you would like to share with our audience, perhaps somebody who's listening and thinking about their own career tra trajectory, anything that you want to leave our audience with? I was struck by um, the last, I think it was your, the last podcast that you published that was about limiting beliefs. I, I was struck by that because I experience those very things myself that I found that especially as I was starting out some of the the biggest hurdles and breakthroughs that I that I had were internal that it wasn't there wasn't necessarily yeah there's there's challenges out in the world that you have to overcome but the biggest things that I overcame that really kind of opened the floodgates of possibility for me were internal it one one example was a conversation I was having with a friend and I was saying I was still working as an audio video guy at Warner Music Group in LA, which was a fine gig. It was, it was fun, but I really wanted to be an artist. And I was talking to my best friend and I was saying, ah, I just want to be an artist. And, and he goes, one day he goes, Max, you got to stop saying that. And I'm like, why? And he says, you got to think you are an artist. You are one inside. You already are one, you know? So stop saying, I have to be one. You're just spinning your wheels. You are an artist. Maybe you need to change the, the question to like, how do I make a living as an artist? You know, just that shift in mentality was a huge difference. Another one was my uncle. I say, I just want to be an artist. And my uncle says, well, what do you need to do to be an artist? And I said, I don't know. I need to get some paintings in a gallery. And he goes, yeah, but what do you need to make those paintings? Do you need like a table and some art supplies? <laughs> You know, and it was like, I realized, oh yeah, you know, I need a, a workspace. I'm like, I, I wasn't looking at the step that was right in front of me. I was looking off in the distance and not realizing these baby steps that I could be taking, you know, towards that goal in the distance. And those, those thing, things like that, just look at those things that you can do right now and, and do those little things. And those things will get you to that thing in the distance. But if you just sit here and yearn for that thing in the distance without making any, you know, any steps towards it, then it's always going to be in the distance. Amazing. Amazing pearls of wisdom from Max Notra. Thank you so much, Max, for joining me today. It's been such a pleasure to catch up. Do tell our listeners how they can learn more about you and also more about Mia Wolf. Yeah. Oh, well, you can check out my stuff at maxneutra.com. Um, you can find me on Instagram, Max Neutra. 
you'll you'll find me or on the, you just google me you'll find me and um meow wolf is the same thing you'll just google meow wolf and you'll find all kinds of crazy stuff there's some great advertisements for omega mart that are on youtube right now that are just so fun and funny um and keep an eye out for denver later this year wonderful all right that's a wrap folks thank you so much max it's been a pleasure thank you so much all right that was awesome thank you max that was super fun.